know you had a musical childhood, but but I'm curious when you first kind of realized that uh, like scoring music for a movie was a job. Was there a film that kind of set off a light bulb in your head of like, oh, someone made this music specifically for this movie? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never had any ambitions to be a film composer, that's for sure. But uh, when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think that one just blew me out of my seat. And um, it was just such an exhilarating experience. And the music was such a huge part of it, uh, much more than I guess Star Wars had come before that, or maybe even a couple of Star Wars. I'm not, I don't know. Larry Kazan is a good friend of mine. I should know the, the <laughs> chronology there. But um, I mean, it's, and it's not even that after seeing Raiders uh, that I thought I wanted to be a film composer because I would have no idea how to do anything like that. But it did sort of plant some seed in the back of my head. And then I guess it turned out, but I, at that point I'd been doing a lot of orchestrations for records and I was a session musician. And um, so I kind of, I did have definitely a, um, a familiarity to some extent with the orchestra and I, done a lot of synth work as a session musician and touring and bands. And so I had a little bit of everything that uh, really became useful when I was offered that first job, which I turned down by the way, but eventually. <laughs> Why'd you turn it down? Fear. Um, I, I, you know, I have no idea how to write music for a movie. I have no idea how to synchronize it. I have no idea about anything. And as soon as I <clears throat> finally said yes to it, um, I was pretty good at it, kind of right at the beginning. I mean, I found that I just had ideas right away and they weren't always good ideas, that's for sure. But it was never hard for me to come up with some music, some kind of music for a scene. Um, as I said, a lot of times it was probably <laughs> the wrong music for the scene, but uh, <laughs> I, I was never short on ideas. Well, I, I definitely want to dig into your film work, but I, I do have to ask how you came to be touring with Elton John and, and what that experience was like, because that, uh, that's a pretty huge thing. That was a huge thing. I was, let's see, that was 1974, um, I think, maybe 75, but I was, I was um, playing with a, a girl named Melissa Manchester, who's kind of turned more into a... a a very pop kind of singer in the seventies and kind of folky as well. And I was, you know, traveling around in a station wagon and carrying my Hammond organ upstairs and making about 200 bucks a week. Um, and I had, I had made this little solo album, a little instrumental album that was sounded like movie music. Um, and I was shopping around to different labels with my manager. And uh, one day I went to the, offices of ABC Dunhill, which was a label back in the 70s. And I had a meeting with the A&R guy there <clears throat> who was named Gary Katz. And Gary Katz turned out to be the producer of Steely Dan in the future, when the future arrived. Um, and he said, wow, he listened to my album. He says, I think you're great, but nobody's going to sign you around here. There's no commercial value at all. Um, good luck. So I went back on the road. And about six months later, I got a call from my then manager saying, asking if I wanted to fly back to LA to meet with Elton John about joining his band. I mean, I had read that Elton had broken up his old band and was starting a new band. I think I read that in Rolling Stone in 74. And, you know, thought bubble came up. Oh my God, what a job that would be. I, I had no money. I had, you know, not much of anything going on. So all of a sudden I was offered this opportunity um, and I flew back and, uh, I was told to go to the Hamburger Hamlet on Sunset Boulevard in Doheny and look for a purple Rolls Royce, which I did. So I drove up in my beat up Volkswagen, pulled up behind this Rolls Royce and a bearded man got out and said, are you James Howard? And I said, yeah, and he said, follow me. So I followed this purple Rolls Royce way up in the hills and we finally pulled up in front of this gigantic mansion and I was escorted inside and I was sitting in the living room uh, and all of a sudden bounds in uh, Elton who was, I guess 28 and I was 23 or 24. Um, and he was, and he said, oh, hey, I'll play you my new album. And it was uh, Captain Fantastic. Um, so he sat there and very awkwardly. And I was, I think we were both more nervous than the other. I, I hardly said, I didn't know what to say. Um, and I asked a couple of lame questions <laughs> <laughs> like you do when you're nervous, you know, yeah. trying to make conversation. And uh, 
after we were done, he said, well, you got the gig if you want it. And again, I didn't know how to process that. And he wrote out, which I wish I'd kept, a, a set list and of songs he wanted me to learn in the next week. Um, there were about 32 of them. Because the next week we were on a plane for Amsterdam where we began rehearsing with this new band. And then we performed at Wembley Stadium, I think two weeks after that. So I went from zero to Wembley Stadium in a very short time. But, and then I, I understood the reason he had hired me. Um, and I forgot to mention this is on my way out after he hired me, I saw two copies of that solo album that I had done. And I think what it, in fact, I know what had happened is Elton's agent had called this guy, Gary Katz and said, do you have any keyboard players that you think would be good to join Elton's band? He said, well, there's this young kid named James Newton Howard. He came in. I think he's really interesting, really good. I have no idea, but he might be good. So, it was that recommendation that then went to Elton. Elton listened to the album, offered me the gig, changed my life. That's amazing. Um, uh, and and uh, I mean, so you mentioned you you make the transition to to scoring films, and you have some ideas, some good, some bad. Um, but you you know you earned your first Oscar nomination for Prince of Ties, and I'm curious uh, what that experience was like for you, kind of what that meant for you, and and um, you know maybe how that changed your career at that point in time. It was, you know, obviously thrilling to get an Oscar nomination. I, I really, I, I think I wasn't even aware they were coming out the next day, which, which obviously once you're in the business for a while, you do start to become aware of those things. And maybe you have a hard time sleeping the night before, although I got over that for, for a long period of time. But um, it was thrilling, you know. I, uh, hmm, it did it change my... I think it put me on the map a little bit. It's not like I went, you know, I always think of other composers who seem to have meteoric rises. They, they did one movie um, and deservingly so. I'm not being critical of that at all. Like, um, I can't think of his name right now. You know, the guy with the long hair did the great- Ludwig Goransson. Uh, he's Black really Panther. talented. Yeah. He, you know, he came along, did that Black Panther movie and then he's huge and that's great. But my path was not like that. Um, so I got that nomination. And then I think I had a big year after that. I think after that I did Grand Canyon. Gosh, I can't remember the chronology, but I had a big year. And then I remember I had a really small year and, um, uh, I still tease my agents about it. You know, after I managed to get a nomination, work with Lawrence Kasdan and, um, a bunch of other good people, I still couldn't manage to get a decent movie for a while, but then that all changed. I, I think it, it was cumulative, you know, I think, and I could be wrong. I think I did Pretty Woman before uh, um, Prince of Tides and then Prince of Tides came along and people noticed, just started noticing my work. And I did a movie that I loved to death called uh, The Man in the Moon with Reese Witherspoon that same year. Um, then I did a bunch of terrible movies for a while. Uh, but then I was offered a movie called The Package. And that was my first action movie. And that was a huge deal for me. Andy Davis offered me that. And I'm not quite sure why he offered it to me because I didn't have a lot to show for myself at that point. But he just really believed in me and I did it. And he liked the score a lot. And his next movie was The Fugitive. And when The Fugitive came along, that was a huge leap for me, That that kind of, put me on another level in terms of action movies, you know? Whatever movie you do that happens to be a big hit is the movie everybody's gonna offer you for a while, you know? So when I did Pretty Woman, I got a bunch of rom-coms, I think. And when I did, I didn't probably get much when I did mm, Man on the Moon because nobody saw the movie, but The Fugitive, definitely I was, I was started to get a lot of big movies, sort of large palettes uh, action movies. Um, but I've always maintained that so much of it, so many of what I think are my best scores um, went by very unnoticed because they're just not attached to the right movie. And it really is that combination that becomes the most impactful thing, I think. Well, and I mean, you mentioned The Fugitive. That's one of my favorite scores of yours. It's also one of my favorite movies of all time. That movie feels like kind of a perfect just the right people at the right time and the right movie. Uh, and, and there's, a, you know, I can't see any scenes from that movie without thinking of your score. And I can't hear your score without thinking of scenes in that movie. It's just, just this kind of perfect marriage there. 
Um, did you guys know when you were working? I mean, it, it's kind of crazy to think back on it. Like that movie was nominated for best picture. Like it was just this massive and it's an action movie, but it's getting all this critical acclaim. Did you guys know when you were working on it that it was something special? Well, if you talk about test screenings, you know, they, you always get a number uh, of what percentage of the audience definitely liked it and would definitely recommend it. And those are called the top two boxes. And um, that movie, we did a test, it got a 99. So that was an indication that it was going to be popular. I thought it was a great movie, but I was so scared out of my wits the whole time I was doing it. Um, be, it because I had made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I had put up a Jerry Goldsmith cue up against one of them for me just to look what that kind of cue would be. And it was so unbelievable. And I, I concluded that I would never be able to write anything like that ever. And so I was just paralyzed for a couple of weeks, but then I kind of got over it and I, and I just started hacking away. Um, there was a big um, discrepancy between Andy Davis's thinking and my thinking on that movie. Andy kept sending me small, jazz combos that he wanted me to use for the movie. And I kept saying, I think you have a big movie here, Andy. I think we can, you know, do da 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 da. Anyway, so we, we compromised and I wrote, I think for the most part, a pretty big orchestral score, but you know, Wayne Shorter came and played, um, which was probably in the jazzy parts. And that, that I have to credit Andy Davis with. And I think that was a, a color in the movie that was very special. Um, but I think during the, you know, there were four editors working on the movie. Um, I don't think anyone felt that confident that the, the script had not been finished when they started shooting it. I think um, it came out something like eight weeks after principal photography wrapped. There's some <laughs> absurd amount wow. of, of uh, challenges, number of challenges that, that were kind of terrifying. So it was, it was fun when it, when it really did well. Well, you mentioned putting the Jerry Goldsmith cue up. I've talked to some composers who, uh, you know, they're afraid of temp score because they don't want the director to get attached to it. Do you have any strong feelings on the directors you work with using temp before you're done or or um, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really mind temp score too much. I mean, there, there have been isolated cases where I've been up against a cue or a piece that the director just will not let go of. And um, I've had a few very notable uh, crashes like that but as a rule if I don't have the I like to start early and if at all possible I'll start making demos my demos are really good I'll start making demos of the score I'm writing for the movie and try and have them use that as the temp score so the director gets used to identifying with my music and even to the extent where you know a, a hundred minutes of action score will be my demos and we're able to um, <clears throat> oftentimes preview with that, the downside of that is that if they, that every time they change the movie, you have to go back and change your demo, which is a lot of work. So I'm constantly tending the demo, but I look at on the positive side of things, a temp score is probably a director's or one of the director's tools in communicating with a composer because they don't speak the musical language. They, they describe what they want in, in, in relative terms to other work that they, that they like, they may have liked of mine, uh, which makes it even harder. But, um, and then I think, well, that temp score is so bad, I'm gonna be a hero, or <laughs> it's so great, uh, it's really gonna push me into a new, a new level of, you know, of accomplishment. So I, I've come to expect them. Uh, it's, I've never had a real, real horrible problem. Well, it, shortly after The Fugitive, you composed the main theme to ER, uh, which that show just becomes the biggest thing in the country. Uh, and you write a theme that becomes synonymous again with this huge thing. Uh, how did you come to be writing that theme? And what was that experience like for you to now have a theme that you've written that is just, you know, it, for year after year after year, people are hearing it every time they watch ER, it's winning all these awards. It's the highest rated show on television. What was that experience like? Um, that was really fun. I mean, I wrote the theme for ER in 15 minutes, Oh wow! but it was just one of those things that came to me. Um, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dee -dee, I, I, which it just was there. Um, and then that little siren thing, wee -wee -wee -wee. Mm -hmm. that seemed like something to do. Um, <laughs> and then I went back and looked at, and I realized that Quincy Jones had done a siren too. And some, I don't know some, but I, it wasn't like my siren, but, 
um, John Wells called me and, and um, I didn't know John. And he said, I'm doing this um, series called ER and um, do you want to do the music? And I said, well, I'll, I'll do the, how about if I do the pilot and I'll do the first three episodes. And then I, I'd like to hand it off to a friend of mine who's a composer, which I did to a guy named Marty Davich. And Marty did it for, I don't know, 10 years after that or something. But, you know, the, the, it's, it's a great thing to have something be so popular, but it's also kind of damning in the way that I think in my obituary, it'll say James Eden Howard, the composer, the theme to ER, when I think I've done things that are better than the theme to ER. But it was really, <laughs> it was really fun. It's always fun to have a big success. No, I can't lie. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's just one of those pieces of iconography, like, you know, Jurassic Park, you hear the John Williams theme. So I think it's just one of those things that's in the public consciousness. Yeah. Um, which is fun. Um, but I mean, versatility is kind of a theme of your career. And, and I wanted to talk about, you know, in 1999, you collaborate with M. Night Shyamalan on The Sixth Sense, um, which again is this massive su success. And it starts off this partnership um, throughout his career. But, you know, I think you guys, your collaborations, um, both the films and the scores are, are really tremendous. And I was curious um, kind of what that initial experience was like and how maybe your collaborations have evolved over the years. That was a huge, huge change, game change for me working with Knight, create, creatively speaking. Um, you know, I, uh, we met at, at the Sh at Shutter's Hotel after, after I was shown the movie at, at the Disney lot. And when I saw the movie with Temp School, with Sixth Sense I'm talking about, you know, I, I was not one of these people that anticipated the ending. So when the ending came, my jaw just dropped and I, I just loved it. Um, and so he attempted with classical music only, no movie music. You know, Ligeti, some, I don't know, not, uh, I don't know, a bunch of stuff that was Thomas Otis, which was crazy good. Um, and so we met and we talked and uh, we hit it off very well. We had a short time to do it. I think the first time was six weeks. But then he said to me after it was over and the movie got a few nominations and I was not one of the thing, the nominated categories. And Knight uh, called me up and uh, we became very close. And he said, you know, the reason you did, you, he, he had a reason for everything, but, and he wasn't wrong to some extent. He said, the reason you didn't get nominated is because the music had no singular quality. You know, it could have been music from any scary movie, which I don't really agree. I think I had something of a singular quality. <laughs> but I, anyway, I took it to heart. And on the next movie, Unbreakable, um, he was story he was storyboarding the movie in Philadelphia. I was in LA. He said, "Can you just start writing music based on the theme, based on the script?" And so I did, and um, I sent him four or five different ideas, and he picked the idea that I liked least, and that was the one with the little trip hop drums. But it was a it was, a, it was a little motif more than a theme and it became, and I just started to use it. He wanted to put it everywhere in the movie in variation, different variations. So from then on, we would try and come up with a very, to use Knight's word, singular or memorable motif or idea that would really be the heart of the score. And I would be much more disciplined about what music I was using in what scene. Um, why was I playing this theme here? Did this theme have anything to do with storytelling? Um, how can we tell a scary, scary idea? Um, Signs is a good example. Signs has based on three notes. Um, Knight wanted me to use that, those three notes and everything. So I had to figure out a way of doing it in a scary way, which I did in the main title. And but it's also in a quite, emotional and evocative way in a few places where it's, it's quite beautiful, where I change the harmonies and I change the notes. And so what he did, he, he changed the way I, I wrote music, quite frankly. Uh, wow. It did change. I became more, hmm, more disciplined, it's about, more austere, I would say. My writing is more austere with his movies. Um, and I can, I can go to other places. I, I'm not stuck in austerity forever, but that was a place I had to get to whenever I was working with Knight. Um, and it was, it was great. It was really, it was really uh, had a defining sound. It really fit his movies. He, um, 
it started me writing music before I saw the movie, which is something I still do, which I think is really helpful. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was a meaningful collaboration. I think your work on The Village is great. And I think that movie overall is pretty underrated. Um, I just, I, I love agree. that score so much. I couldn't agree. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I wrote a completely different score for that movie. Oh, wow. Early on. And, you know, because I think the studio wanted it to be more of an action movie. So I was mm -hmm. trying to write more of an action score and we would watch the movie and just seem to be completely out of sync emotionally. Um, and so uh, Knight said, well, what else can you do? And I said, well, what if we write something that's really from the girls, the blind girl, I can't remember her name now, perspective. And I thought of a female violin, solo violin. And um, I was fortunate enough to have Hilary Hahn play all the violin parts on that. And it was beautiful, yeah. You illuminate something that it, it strikes me that people may have this uh, misconception that composers just write a score and hand it over and the director and studio say, great, now it's done. Um, but in talking about, you know, you, uh, I'm, I'm curious, like from what, from your perspective, that collaboration process and also, you know, serving the director's vision or serve it, serving the studio's vision, does that get frustrating for you? And how do you kind of navigate that while maintaining true to what you believe is good work, um, but also, you know, serving the other people who have their own visions for the film. Yeah, I mean, that's almost like a fundamental challenge of the job, you know, it's uh, writing is easy, rewriting is what you end up doing in, in the movie, in the film music world. And, uh, and once you've had a piece of music rejected four or five times from the director, it's very easy to go down the slippery slope of, of trying to just make the director happy and you articulated it very well and it's sort of selling your soul to the devil. Um, it's, it takes a lot of patience to navigate that. Um, I, I found that I just, it, I was reluctant to rewrite, well, let's see, what was my reluctance I was asking myself? Why was I so, you know, did I want to strangle a director for not liking a piece of music? And I realized that part of it came down to just the physical discomfort the physical challenge of getting yourself up again and emotionally as excited the second, the third, the fourth time around that you were the first time is very, very difficult. Now, if you have a strong director involved, then, then you don't need to worry too much about other people who are in the mix. Some producers, maybe some studio executives, although studio is always gonna be a force and I understand that. Um, you know, my first rewriting over and over and over and over happened on Prince of Tides. Um, and that was with Barbara. And Barbara just had a relentless desire, a pursuit, which was totally honorable uh, to make sure that we found the right thing. And who can blame her for that? You know, so she was the first one where I started to put V numbers at the end of the piece, like V14, version 16. That reached kind of crazy levels um, or unheard of levels for me on uh, the Fantastic Beast movies where I wrote, for instance, the main title, which I, I do this presentation that's kind of fun where I show, uh, uh, it took me seven months to write that score, but the, it took me almost six of those months to find the main title, which was about 37 seconds long that what worked as a main title, what announced, what was what worked to announce a new franchise, what worked so that they weren't gonna use Hedwig's theme throughout my score to Fantastic Beasts. And um, I ended up writing nearly 40 versions of that um, over a period of six months and finally arrived at one that, that I thought was good and that made it into the movie. Now those, those, those are not 40 completely ground up rewrite page one rewrite versions, but they are at least based on six different ideas. So it took a long time. Um, I think I'm at a point now hmm, where I just, the director happy and me happy is one idea. So if the director's not happy, then I can't be happy. And I, so I'm not gonna write something just to make, do you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. now, yeah. I, I feel very empathic with a director, even when they're difficult, because I think fundamentally, I feel sorry for directors. <laughs> and I think you kind of have to have that feeling. You have to feel like you want to take care of them because they've stepped out into this, such a difficult 
job. You know, they've been, it's been gestating in their brains for two years or longer or 10 years. And I come along and maybe I'm going to be involved for three or four months, but I'm the last thing that they can change. And so I, uh, I, re I really do care about, to some degree, their, their well-being, helping them get through this process. It also helps to do that because you'll probably get hired by them again, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. But so I know some people that it's also, that doesn't mean I don't, my blood doesn't boil. There are times I just really want to quit. I go through all that, little temper tantrums, but I'm way more collaborative than I used to be. <laughs> well, to that point, uh, I'm very fascinated by King Kong uh, because you were brought in at the very last minute. Um, I'm curious what that experience was like for you. Did you listen to Howard's score at all? You know, what was that time crunch like to score a very long, uh, you know, massive movie in a very short amount of time? I, I never heard one note of Howard's score. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I respected that relationship between Howard and Peter, obviously, tremendously. Um, when the call came, would I be interested in doing it? I'd have five weeks and there's three hours of music and, and my stomach immediately almost, without saying so, uh, almost threw up because I, I knew I was gonna say yes. And I knew what that was gonna be like for the next five, five weeks. So um, Peter and I would get, we would talk to each other over something like this. It was called the polycom system, slightly different, where he would be in sync with my sequencer and he would be hearing exactly what I'm hearing. And I would write you know, for 16 hours a day or more and send him demos every day. And we, that's the, we never met, we would talk to each other. Uh, he's in New Zealand, I'm in Santa Monica um, and we would talk it over. And then the next day I would go to work and the process just worked like that. And for the most part, it was going extremely smoothly. I mean, I was writing, in some cases I would write 10 minutes in a day, which is just crazy time. I was just on fire in a way. I think it was adrenaline, it was, and I loved the movie and King Kong was like, if you're gonna be a film composer, what's better than King Kong climbing the Empire State Building? You know, I mean, that's just such a grand event. Um, and then we got to the part where uh, the Macy's queue, where he's rampaging through New York and, uh, and all of a sudden he sees Anne standing in the street and he stops. And she walks up to him, he picks her up. They have this moment of the platonic bliss um, they go into ice skating and he goes sliding around and then the bombs start going off. That particular cue, I could not get past Peter and I was running out of time. And th that was not allowed for me to not have a cue accepted and to be spending days on it was really threatening because we had no time. And he finally said, you know, James, tonight when you quit writing at four or whatever in the morning, before you go home, just turn down the lights and improvise on piano for 10 minutes and send it to me. So I said, yeah, okay, all right, I'll do it. And I'm, I did it and I sent him the next day. I got a, a he's on the video and he says, James, I'm really excited. I go, great. He goes, at minute three minutes and 14 seconds, there's about six seconds. He says, I think it's six seconds about that really has something special. I don't want you to use that, but there's something there that is perfect. And so I couldn't really celebrate that because yeah. there were six seconds that he liked, mm -hmm. but uh, to his credit, that six seconds did become the, the seed of what I figured out what it must've been. It was a chord change. It was a little bit of this. Um, and I wrote the rest of it and it was a sale. <laughs> so that was a wonderful process. And I think a lot of directors given the opportunity to use music that is not necessarily written for their scene is something that, well, I experienced a lot with Chris Nolan, with Hans. Um, Chris in the beginning of Batman Begins wouldn't even give us the movie. Hans and I would just write music and send it to him. And he'd say, oh, I really like that bit. Uh, send that to me, but add two more minutes to it, something like that. So we kept doing that and we didn't see the movie for a long time. Um, but I understand, I appreciate that when a director does that, it's possible that you get many sort of happy accidents, you know, that they hit something or a chord hits some 
piece of action in the movie is in sync with a piece of action in the movie that I never would have imagined would that I would have gone after or pursued. But so I've, I've learned to appreciate, you know, these different modalities that directors get into. Well, you mentioned Batman Begins. That That's a unique thing for, you know, two of the biggest composers in the world to team up. How did that happen essentially? And, and what was that like to work on Batman Begins and The Dark Knight? And did you guys split duties? How did that collaboration work? Well, Hans and I were had become good friends. Um, he was, you know, he reached out to me after Grand Canyon, I think, <clears throat> and just, that's the way he is. He's very generous. He called up and said, I just want to tell you, I think that's a great score. And then when he heard I was doing Waterworld, <clears throat> he sent me as a gift. I think he felt sorry for me. He sent me as a gift, this massive collection of samples of his that he had made with the London Symphony. I mean, those kinds of just gestures just don't occur. Uh, film composers are very solitary creatures. We, we don't hang out with each other that much. Anyway, we had become good friends. And then I, and then there was a David Kep movie that came along called Secret Windows, Secret Garden. And Hans and I had talked that, you know, at, at one point we were saying, gosh, you know, how many more car chases can we write? How many more? Da, da, da. And I think he said, yeah, what if I started a queue in some movie, I start a queue and you finish it. And then you start a queue and I finish it. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> so when David called me um, to do a movie, I said, well, what would you think if I did it with Hans Zimmer? He said, great, that sounds wonderful. And then for a number of reasons, uh, I was going through some personal stuff. I think I was getting divorced. Um, and it just, uh, it, it didn't happen. And I think, um, not I think, I pulled out of the movie, which is um, a very difficult thing to do because David is a good friend, but he was supportive. Um, so that idea went away. And then Chris Nolan called Hans and said, I'm doing this Batman movie. Do you want to do it? And Hans said, yeah, can I do it with my mate, James Newton Howard? And he said, yeah, great. Um, and the thing is, Hans and I are wi wildly different musical entities, but we do have a similar process. We use the same technology. We tend to approach scores the way you would approach, approach making a record. That is the production values are extremely important to us. How the bass drum sounds, what the low end is like, is, a, is the mid range too harsh, do the strings sound? You know, we really try and shape it sonically. And, and so that allowed us to have a lot of commonality. And uh, we set up two recording studios or two writing studios at Air Studios in London, um, up on the third floor across the hall from each other. And his door was open, I could hear what he was doing and my door was open, he could hear what I was doing. We were smoking like chimneys. And um, on that movie, on Batman Begins, we, we truly did co-write every cue together with the exception of the most famous cue, which he wrote, which is the two, the two note thing, which was fabulous. But every day Chris would come over from, he was dubbing, I think pre-dubbing the movie, he would come over and we would plan what, what we'd done. And it was just really, really fun. And so we made it, I learned a lot from Hans. I learned a lot mainly about film score, film composing should be fun. It should be fun mostly. And I had reached a point where, you know, when I'd left Secret Garden and I had just finished, I think Collateral with Michael Mann. And I don't know, I was going through a tough time and I was ready to take a long break. And Hunt said, no, come over, we'll have fun. And, you know, it really taught me to, to relax a little bit. Um, Dark Knight was a little bit different. We did most of the writing in Los Angeles. His studio in LA is about 300 yards from my studio. It's very close. Um, we split up some of the assignments. He took uh, the Joker, did a, such a crazy good job on that. Um, I took Two-Face and some of the, and then we split up some of the action stuff. I did predictably maybe more of the psychological stuff, but you know, we went through it and, and it was great. It was also great fun. Um, and then I did it. And then I think Chris, whatever the, Hans did another movie. Like, was it, uh, what was the next one he did with Grant? Inception, I, maybe? I or did. Interstellar? Maybe it was Inception. I think it was Inception. And it was clear to me that those two guys had such a great relationship. Yeah. That when, when The Dark Knight Rises came along, I just politely said, you know what, you guys do it. I, I think I've, I've got other movies 
that I'm doing and I think I've offered everything and you guys are killing it. So I just bowed out and, uh, but it was very friendly. Well, I, I love your collaborations on those two scores. And I think it comes to a really emotional head with the two Face stuff in the, in the finale of the dark Knight. Um, mm -hmm. when you've got Gary Oldman there and everything. Mm. Well, you know, he's such an extraordinary filmmaker. I mean, really challenging for me. Yeah. Really challenging because you can't, you know, you always, you can't predict what he's going to hear and what he's going to respond. I, I, there are situations and not just Chris, but a number of directors where I would bet the farm that I'm going to play on a cue that's going to knock their socks off. They're going to just be on their knees thanking me. And I play it and they're sitting behind me, oh, behind me, always on my couch. And it's just silence. And I'm just like, oh, geez, do I have to turn around? And, and it's a big miss, you know, and, and you, it's so Chris is one of those people I found for me. It was, he really is, he, he loves adventure and experimentation, deviating from what is expected. I tend to be more of a traditionalist. I mean, I really am. I'm a 19th century romantic guy that happens to be pretty good at electronics when I need them, but <laughs> you know, I'm a melody. I live there more, but anyway, he's, he's great. I learned a lot from Chris. Well, I think that's what makes you such a good fit. And before we get into news of the world, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I mean, Batman Begins, yes, starting a franchise, but in particular franchise filmmaking with, you talked a little bit about Fantastic Beasts and, but also the Hunger Games and thinking about, you know, you're having to create cues that are going to live on in future films and, and the difficulty in finding the right thing. But I think you find this, this really beautiful uh, harmony between something that is going to service the action and the bombast, but also has a really emotional center. And I was curious what that experience was like for you on those two franchises in particular, The Hunger Games and uh, uh, Fantastic Beasts. You know, on The Hunger Games, of course, the first one was directed by Gary Ross. So it was, and it was a much, in a way, a much smaller movie. Yeah. And you felt like it was really taking place mostly in a Appalachian village and a little glimpse of the the, I can't remember what the bad town is called, uh, the center or, you know, but uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so that was one, one approach. And then, then when Francis came along, he made a catching fire was a, just a bigger palette. It was a bigger canvas, I guess is the word. Um, but I was still very determined, you know, to make the theme, the thematic stuff uh, consistent with from the very first as much as I could. And I think the, the two most significant themes that I brought from the very beginning, from the first one is when Rue's farewell, there's a scene where when Rue dies and she's comforting her and crying and then she turns around and looks at the camera, which she knows is ever present and gives that sign. I don't know what the sign is. Um, that theme, which became, I don't know, I guess it's Rue's theme somehow, but um, and there was a one, a little tiny one in um, when she was healing, when Katniss was healing, who was her boyfriend? I'm terrible memory. Anyway. Yeah, those, there's two of them. <laughs> I can't remember which one she was with at the time. I, br I brought those, uh, those themes forward, but there was a huge amount of action music in now in Catching Fire. So I try and reuse themes, even in action music, as much as possible to give them a thematic shape. Because I think just writing really loud kind of uh, directionless music is, is, can be exhausting for the, for the audience. So I try and give them these, these milestones every now and then to hold on to. But essentially the heart and soul of the movie for me is always gonna be a theme and is always gonna have an emotional, I'm interested in human emotion. That's what really gets me interested. And I'm interested in the complexity of human relationships and there was a lot of that to exploit in the, in the Hunger Games movies, surprisingly. So I think they were, even though they were uh, kind of a, more of a teenage thing, I guess, in the beginning, I think Francis did a, did a very great job of turning it into something that, that, that talked about fundamental conflicts in, in society. And, and um, so it was easy to balance those things. Fantastic Beast was very, was very scary um, and challenging because the legacy, it was a new, new franchise, but it existed in the Harry Potter universe. So you knew that John Williams was going to be lurking <laughs> and sort of hovering. And when I first started work on that, 
I was doing music that I thought was right. And David Yates, the director, felt that I was going too much in a John Williams direction. And so I had to bring back certain orchestrational techniques and to not sound like that. I didn't think it was that much, but eventually it was just a question of immersing him as much as I possibly could in my demos of the themes that I had written, which I really believed in. I really believed in Newt's theme, um, believed in the, uh, the, uh, the love sort of love theme between Newt and, um, I can't remember her name, it's embarrassing, but I should have a list of all the main characters in every movie I did, but. I also, um, I also forget, it's fine. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, uh, just a lot of theme, a lot of theme uh, for me always. And if, and if you watch John Williams movies, which I do a lot, he's just stating the theme over and over again in little tiny ways, just a clarinet lick up there. So I was doing that a lot, but I just wanted to make sure that there were scenes where people should be tearing up in those movies. And if I'm not, if people aren't tearing up, then I don't think I'm doing my job. Um, I don't know. I probably didn't answer your question very well. <laughs> No, that's great. Because uh, there is some like emotionality that's kind of unstated or hard to um, uh, specifically like discuss with those films. But there's something about the score because, you know, I watch a lot of franchise movies and sometimes it just sounds like sound. Uh, and that's not what those films sound like at all. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I always say that I think action music is the heart. It's the hardest to do well. Um, <clears throat> Michael Kamen used to describe it as orchestral violence. And I love that because there was there, the real sophisticated way to do an action thing is no drum machines, no percussion underneath it driving it necessarily. That, 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 the, that the rhythm and the propulsion is occurring within the orchestra itself, either with you know pounding strings, pounding, you know, whatever. And that's hard. It takes a lot, you have to make a lot of noise, write a lot of notes and fill up the screen and, and make it smart and not just head bashing. Um, but I was so moved by Francis's filmmaking that I remember there was that scene in Catching Fire where the guy, her boyfriend, they're sitting by the lake and, and he said, he's lamenting his terrible state. And he says, nobody needs me. And then she turns around and says, I need you. And, you know, for me being such a romantic, I, I just, I just knew I could kill that scene. So then I just wrote that dee da 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 dee 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 dee. And it, it was just really great. And I had a moment to really sort of solidify those, that relationship right there. Even though I heard afterwards that Jennifer thought, Jennifer told Francis she thought there was too much kissing in the movie. So she probably didn't <laughs> like it. I liked it a lot. That's fine. I liked it. I liked it a lot as well. Uh, and I, absolutely loved your score for news of the world and i truly believe it's one of your best scores you've written and also feels like a bit of a departure. i mean it, it's unique and that it's your first time working with paul greengrass um and you're doing this western score i was just curious what your initial conversations were with him because he's also making a different kind of movie than he's ever made before yeah um and i'll go back for a moment to my feelings of you know supporting the director and as they step out onto the ice um, I flew out to New Mexico while they were shooting and um, I was a huge fan, needless to say, but I thought John Powell's work with him in the Bourne movies was always so great and uh, such a fab, you know, fantastic composer. Um, but I got there and we're, we're sitting outside in this set and you're just looking all over the place and you just see limitless vistas and it's so inspiring. And Tom was there who I know a little bit and it was such a happy, happy set. And um, Paul and I chatted for a little while. And then he said, you know, what I'm really hoping to do, get from the music is a sense of somehow uh, mirroring this broken world. You know, you've got a world here, a country that where everything is broken. You know, even, yeah. I, even need to say people's relationships are broken, but even perhaps how do we make the music sound broken? Not everywhere, but does, how does it have a central component that sounds uh, like it? You know, their instruments are broken. So <clears throat> we talked about that a lot, and and then of course COVID happened. He's in London. I've never met him again since, 
this was back in November of 19. Wow. So we've never met since, but uh, we began this months long process of me sending demos of him. He always was like this, <laughs> and um, which most directors are pulling out his hair. And most of the time he had notes, you know, I, I wasn't getting it. You know, he wasn't feeling a continuity of uh, tone. Tone is the hard one. Um, I couldn't seem to get the main title right when it's just Tom, when you see Tom by himself, Shane putting his shirt on, you see his scars in his back. And, and it's such a moody, lonely, wintry thing. Um, and Paul ended up guiding me through that um, and understanding that I had to find the difference between sad and solitary because he didn't want it to be sad, but he did want you to feel that this is a, this guy's been living on the fringe of society. Um, in fact, we don't know anything about him really, but, um, and it's almost church-like in a little bit because of these people in a very dim lit room. Um, I've, I had made many attempts at writing it and every time I did, it was too sweet. He said, you're, you're telling us things about this, this uh, character we don't know yet at all. Um, so it would just be a rejection over and over and over again. And then I started to get some stuff right. He was really happy initially with that big shootout, which was really a bear of a scene. When I did it, it was 16 minutes long. And I tried to take a new approach to writing the action music yet again. I thought it was pretty successful. And then the lockdown came. <clears throat> and I left my studio for about eight weeks and he, their, the cutting room closed and after eight weeks, I came back and virtually rewrote the entire score. Um, I came back with so much energy and so much understanding of what Paul was talking about. So I went back and re-demoed every cue, sent it to him, and we were like 80% there. And then it was a question of, okay, when do we, when do we play our hymn? which is really what we started calling this one piece as a hymn, because it is very church-like. And that was, that was inspired by the way Paul had shot those scenes where you feel like he's, a, he's giving a sermon to some extent. And, um, so I think we eventually got a lot of it right, but a lot of that score, you're really not meant to experience so much up front. It's really just kind of working on you in a, in a sort of subliminal level, I guess so that when it does come bursting forth in some moment where they, they really allow it to, you know, when he goes riding back to get the girl or um, even in very quiet moments, it's effective, I think, because it's been working on you all the way, you're just not really thinking about it much, but that's where you really hear the broken stuff is, is in the quieter things. And I thought that, that I, they did such a good mix on that, you know, because they could have jammed up the music too loud in scenes where it shouldn't, wasn't meant to be loud. But, you know, listen, a good movie makes everybody look good. <laughs> um, that, that, that lovely kid, Helena, um, Billy Golden. They're so good. Yeah, I mean, everybody, you should see the movie. Did you see the movie she did before this? No. Um, huh? Crasher? I haven't. See that. You will, okay. She will blow your mind. It's called She's incredible. Crasher. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, it was like a six, seven month gestation period, but, um, really has a very happy ending for me with the way it turned out with Paul. Well, there's this, you know, the film I find is ultimately hopeful and ultimately optimistic, but throughout the tone is there's this sense of melancholy and grief and sorrow, but there is that ultimate hope and optimism. And I think that shines through in the film and the small scenes where you see the humanity, in this harsh broken world, you see little touches of humanity come through. And I yeah. think exactly what you're saying makes perfect sense because I got all of that from your score where, yeah. you know, it is a melancholic and a little grief stricken at times, but there are little flashes, little flutters of kind of a beautiful humanity in there. Mm. Um, I think that's, that's what Paul was interested in. He, he was interested in making a movie where the possibility of, of uh, coming together existed, you know, the, so. It's, it's brilliant. Um, and I was curious, I mean, it, it's, it's a Western. 
I'm curious from you, from your perspective, do you, do you feel like you have a particular sound quote unquote as a composer or do you um, kind of value the versatility of whatever each film needs? Well, I would say I, I certainly, the latter, I value, I, I, I try and do whatever each film needs, but it's inevitable. You're gonna sound like yourself if you're writing four or five hours of music a year. And um, I'm usually one of, uh, not usually, I often am trying not to sound like myself. And then I'll write something that I think, oh, that's good. That doesn't sound like me so much. And then the director will say, you know, that part in here, uh, I don't like, you know, the parts where I've broken free from what people come to expect from me are oftentimes the parts that people that don't respond well to because they hire you to do one thing. And then if you try and do something else, it's a negotiation. Um, I don't, you know, I've never thought that I have a real distinct sound, but a lot of my coworkers, uh, orchestrators and other people think that I very much do. Um, uh, I have certain orchestration techniques that I use over and over, which I try not to do, but I guess I am proud of the versatility. I, I feel like, you know, I've been given all these amazing opportunities and you just, I've said yes and figure out a way to do it. Even if you don't know how to do it in the beginning. What do you think my sound is? I, I, I struggle with it because on the one hand, you look at the fugitive and the village and King Kong and fantastic beasts and they sound very different, but there is something un like intangible about them. That's like, oh yeah, I don't necessarily think, you know, there are some composers where you're like immediately that's Hans Zimmer or like immediately that's, but even Hans will go off and do something that sounds very different. Yes. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't feel like composers I don't feel like most composers fall into a specific box of like, this is what they always sound like. But I do think there is there is some intangible in your work that is unmistakably you. Um, and, and then that's a compliment. I think that- you know. I, I take it as a compliment. You know, I think, I remember talking to Tom Newman at, at, back in at some point, 10 years ago. And of course, during the, there was a period of time with American Beauty and Shawshank Redemption. He wrote these iconic scores in mm. every temp score every temp score. <laughs> and those scores were so distinctive with the hammered dulcimer and a certain kind of thing. Very hard to replace those temp scores because <laughs> if you didn't include the hammered dulcimer in there, they wouldn't be happy. So you have to find ways around it. But I knew he was just as frustrated. You know, he said, I'm really, you know, tired of being hired and have people refer to this or that or that, which has just been happening. Finally, he was able to escape, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a quality problem. Listen, you're getting, yeah. you're getting hired because people like your music. So. It's almost like uh, Hans with the, uh, the Thin Red Line score that was just used everywhere and yeah. trailers and everything. So. Yeah, well, I think Hans is the most influential composer in the world, has been for 20 years. You know, yeah. it was a sports thing. So da -da 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 -da. I mean, he really... He started a thing uh, that is, yeah, still, I still have to deal with it all the time. <laughs> so, but we call each other once in a while and ask if it's okay if we, we, we borrow this. Can I steal that line a little bit? Um, which, of course, we're always happy to do. You know, if somebody's tempt a score, is tempt a piece with your score or his score, and eh, they were not happy until you sound just like it somehow. <laughs> Well, as I said, I, I think News of the World is is one of your best and one of the best scores of the year. Um, so you. you're not you're not doing so shabby yourself. So. No, I'm I'm very happy, grateful. Uh, you've been more than gracious enough with your time. I could pepper you with a million more questions, um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much again um, for talking about uh, all of your incredible work. Well, thank you for asking. It's been really nice talking with you. <laughs>